Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, of course. Um, today I would like to tell you about the connection between differential geometry and combinatorics, which I personally find very surprising. Um, so it relates curvature and what is called the Euler characteristic. One of them, uh, differential geometry, integrals, uh, derivatives, and so on. One of them, combinatorics, more like type of graphs and something like graphs, right? So combinatorics, very discrete, very analytic and very discrete. So a priori, there's no good reason why they should be related at all, but they are very related in a very surprising theorem, in my opinion, uh, which by now basically is about 200 years, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, depends a little bit how you count, but it's called the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. Uh, so it appears in a published work of Bonnet and an unpublished work of Gauss. And Gauss is famous enough that um, whatever Gauss said, it's, it, I have done that before, everyone would believe Gauss. Uh, so roughly 200 years ago, maybe a little bit less, depending how you count, uh, this theorem was discovered. And as I said, the main point here is the relation between a discrete type of well, notion and a very well analytic type of notion. So let's have a look first the analytic one, then the discrete one, and then the relationship between them. So the analytic one, differential geometry, is really differential geometry is curvature. And curvature, or in this case, a certain type of curvature, which is called Gaussian curvature. Well, as I said, published uh, in unpublished work of Gauss. I'm not quite sure whether Gaussian curvature also was an unpublished work, but certainly the Gauss-Bonnet theorem was an up unpublished work of, of Gauss. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, so let's have a look at this definition. So what you have is a surface and some point on your surface. So my, my point here is in the very middle, somewhere here. A uh, surface just means something like a sphere, for example, or a torus or whatever. So two dimensional object, um, which is reasonably smooth, such that you can perform, perform the following measurements. So you take a normal vector to your point so as I said, it's reasonably smooth. So you can talk about tangent space and so on, and you can uh, talk about normal vectors. So normal vector goes roughly in this direction. And well, it's a normal vector and you have a surface. And if you think of this being in three space, then for the normal vector, you have just this abundance of hyperplanes, uh, which where the normal vector lives in. So here, two displayed hyperplanes, um, Certain so planes, well, hyperplanes, they're really planes in this case. Uh, I shouldn't say hyperplanes, but anyway, so they have planes where the vector lives in, and two of them are very special. So those planes will intersect your surface in a curve. So in this case, this hyperplane here, the one that goes from uh, southwest to northeast, intersects the surface roughly in this curve here, roughly in this hyperbola -like type object, whatever. Um, and the other one that goes from maybe a different color, that goes from, uh, what is it? Northwest to Southeast, roughly so intersects the surface in this uh, curve. And what you can do now is you have a curve, you can talk about curvature of a curve um, by just taking some derivatives and there will be a maximum and a minimum obtained for all of these hyperplanes around this normal vector, there will be a maximum and a minimum. So a maximal curvature at a minimal curvature. And well, let's call them K1 and K2 for these curves. Um, these are called the principal curvatures. And you take the product of them to get the Gaussian curvature. And you really want to take the product because in the end, you're kind of more interested in the different behavior of uh, whether it's a positive sign in the end, the product the negative, the negative sign or whether it's actually zero. So in this case, you can already see it. In this case, this is negative curvature. So it will be this part because one of them is positive, the other one is negative and they have a positive number. I just write plus one. The curvature could be plus five or whatever, but um, it's only a matter about signs here mostly. So positive curvature and negative curvature together give negative curvature, of course. For the sphere, well, if you could imagine the same happening here, roughly you get one curve that goes like this and one curve that goes like this. So they will always have the same sign and you will always end up with positive curvature. 
And you really want to do the sign trick because, well, let's say I do it down here and I kind of have the different opposite curvatures. Um, pointing upwards or pointing downwards depends a bit, but you can get rid of those ambiguity by just multiplying them. And then all that matters is the sign. And if you have something flat, we'll see an example for the torus, for example, it's actually flat and torus is curvature zero at some point. So in general, then would have curvature zero. And this is the Gaussian curvature. Note here that you really need a normal vector. You need some smooth structures. This is point wise. So you would like to define then uh, a total curvature. We'll see that later. And how could you define a total curvature? Well, it should be the sum over all curvatures. Then you realize, oops, I should take a sum over all curvatures and the curvatures are defined by per point. So I should take a sum over all points. That's a probably a very infinite sum. Well, okay, so let's just replace the sum by an integral. So integral over all local curvatures should be something like a global curvature. Definitely a notion that depends on kind of the smooth structure and it's, it's really a part of differential geometry. With contrast, there's this other notion related to surfaces, which is called the Euler characteristic. And it has absolutely nothing to do, at least uh, from just from plain sight here, but everything, everything is kind of hidden in plain sight. Um, with differential geometry. It's really just a combinatorial notion. So basically you take a triangulation, a triangulation in a certain sense, um, those generalized triangulations called the cell structure. I will explain it on with an example on a torus. And the cell structure is made out of vertices, edges, and faces. And you just take this alternating sum. Vertices minus edges, number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces, and you call that the Euler characteristic. Note that there is no differential geometry involved whatsoever. It's a simple counting along a triangulation. Um, for torus, for example, you can do the following. So here's a cell structure on a torus, very nicely illustrated in this uh, stolen illustration. I mean, um, uh, so you start with the flat torus. You fold it and you get to the cylinder. And if you close the ends of a cylinder, you get the torus, uh, which is this hollow donut. Keep in mind the torus is a hollow donut. It's not a donut, it's a hollow donut. So there's kind of air in between if you want. Anyway, so this is how it looks like. And here is kind of a fixing vertex. Maybe I should use a different color. So here's a fixing vertex. And then you have an edge going all the way this way, an edge going all the way this way. One edge is here, just uh, the other edge is here. So you have one vertex with two edges. And then you can already see it in this picture here. You just glue in one face. This is all one face, and this will fill up the rest of the torus. So everything here is just one face. It just wraps around the torus, right? So you can, it's best to imagine in this picture. So this is simply the torus by identifying those two ends here. And whatever I've colored in green is the one face that you see here. And so one face. And you get the equation 1 minus 2 plus 1, uh, which is 0, for example. So we can associate a number to a surface. And this is done in, the, in a way such that it's independent of the choice of this state st structure of this triangulation, which is not completely obvious, but it is independent of the choice of the set structure. Um, but the point here for today's video, at least, is that this is, at least to me, this just really looks like an object of combinatorics. So you count, you basically have a fancy version of a graph on your surface that determines your surface. And you, you just count vertices, edges, and faces. And that's it. There's no curvature or anything involved whatsoever. It really, really, really looks very different. And then, well, something funny happens. And this was definitely somehow known to Gauss. Uh, it's probably very hard to track back. But if you do this example of the donut, of the hollow donut, the torus, you all, I just did it. The Euler characteristic is zero, right? I just did that here. The Euler characteristic was zero by this easy counting argument. Uh, not too hard, but certainly more complicated to see is the curvature is also zero. And basically what happens is for the torus, you have certain points of positive curvature, you have certain points of negative curvature. And in this sum, in the global curvature, they just cancel out and you get uh, zero curvature. Um, so yes, something, something is going on, right? Although kind of obviously they have not, these two notions have nothing in common. Well, maybe not 
So here the same count works. And of course you could check that as well for some sphere or some, something and it would still work. Um, and it's kind of really weird because curvature is a part of differential geometry, right? You have curves, <laughs> curved curves, curved curves, very nice. And order characteristic is, well, well, it's a bit debatable, but I would call it it's part of um, combinatorics. And the gauss bonnet theorem really, really just relates to two, which is a very surprising result. So let's have a look at the theorem. It's kind of beautiful. It goes, as I said, back to gauss bonnet So um, the point is, well, whenever you wiggle your surface, certainly the local curvature could change at a point, right? You could just disturb it a bit. Um, so curvature has a very rigid notion. You're a priori not allowed to move your surface or to, to rubber move your surface around to, uh, to distort it or whatever. Um, but the global curvature turns out, and that's the main theorem, the global curvature is actually a topological invariant. So the statement here is, well, we have some nice thing, a nice surface type object. I don't want to go too much into the details. And then the global curvature that's on the right hand, left hand side. So just the integral, the sum over all local curvatures equals, well, there's a two, who cares about the two, equals the Euler characteristic of the surface up to uh, an overall factor of two. And you can definitely scale out the overall factor if you want to. But anyway, I stay with this formulation. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you have something that is part of differential geometry where you're not really allowed to change your surface in some sense. On the right-hand side, you have this notion that is just in, in a very topological way, in a rubber geometry way, associated to your surface. And they are the same. So this is really weird. So chi is a topological invariant. This is not trivial, but also not hard to see. Um, I kind of said that before, it doesn't really depend on, depend on the triangulation. You always get the same result. And because of you have now this equation here, uh, of course, then the global curvature, so this is just as simple as I said for the global curvature, is as well. And that's absolutely non-trivial. In particular, the torus is flat because the Euler characteristic is zero. So the global curvature of a torus is always zero. And zero is of course, kind of by this definition of curvature. Um, if you think about it a little bit, you get zero whenever you have something that is flat, right? Um, and you would get zero. So the torus actually is a flat object, globally speaking. And you can't do anything. It doesn't depend on your embedding of the torus or whatever. It's just always a flat object which is kind of really cool result. Um, in the same way, for example, the sphere, which is positive Euler characteristic is always positively curved. You can't do anything. No manipulation of the sphere will make it flat or negatively curved and so on. So this is a really cool theorem relating to completely unrelated notions, or at least uh, just from the first sight, they're really completely unrelated combinatorics and uh, differential geometry. Why should they be related? But to Gauss Bonnet say they're basically the same in some sense. And then Gauss Bonnet has been generalized to many, many situations. Um, here I picked a, a paper, a quite a recent one that I link in the description, which I don't want to go too much into details. It's, it's relatively readable. So if you want to have a look, um, but you could definitely kind of use it or work out discrete versions of Gauss Bonnet. Uh, one of them, for example, is for graphs. And how does it work? There's a certain notion of curvature for graphs explained in this paper. And um, the Euler characteristic for graphs is really just, again, vertices minus edges. There are no faces at all. That's the Euler characteristic. That's just a simple counting argument. Um, so this guy here has quite a few vertices, uh, quite a few edges. Apparently, the Euler characteristic is minus 4. Um, well, whatever. This is a really simple counting argument. The computer can do that easily. You just need to count, as I said, the number of vertices and the number of edges. And the curvatures along the points here are those numbers, whatever, um, and so on. Bop, 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 bop. And if you take the sum over them, you actually get the Euler characteristic again. I'm not quite sure whether the two vanish. There's probably a rescaling. But basically, you get the same result. The gauss bonnet theorem for graphs, as explained in this paper. Uh, the basic point of this paper is to have the correct notion of curvature for a graph, um, which uses some local uh, spheres. It's actually pretty nice. As I said, I don't want to go into details, but it's, it's nicely explained in the description. And uh, sorry, not in the description, in the link in the description. And from that, you get kind of a discrete version of Gauss-Bonnet. And there are various 
other discrete versions of Gauss Bonnet as well. And this should always be something like curvature, some object of differential geometry equals Euler characteristic, some object of combinatorics. Note here that I definitely have just the sum here because this is really a discrete version, it's a finite version. So it's really just the sum over all curvatures, which is kind of the same here, just it's infinite. And whenever something is infinite, it might make more sense to write down an integral. Anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.